All right, welcome to this interview. This is going to be a four-part interview that we decided to break up for the very reasons that there's a lot of heavy material here, it gets pretty intense from an emotional perspective, and at the same time, it reveals something that's just so important to what we're uncovering as humanity during this time that we wanted to make sure we took the proper time to really go through this content. So what you're gonna watch coming up here is four different parts following Annika Lucas's journey as a child sex slave. Now this starts getting into, you know, uh, what the elite pedophilia stuff that we start talking about. This gets into the, the child trafficking and all that sort of stuff. But really this starts looking at a deep, you know, uh, I guess you could say puzzle that is starting to form or starting to come together here as we're uncovering and looking at this sort of uh, elite pedophilia that does happen. I know a lot of us want to turn a blind eye to it or want to pretend that it's not happening. And, you know, that's fair. It's fair to be able to say, like, you know, these are dark things if we have to look at this. This is a dark aspect of humanity that we're going to have to face. And maybe I'm not ready or maybe I don't want to face that. That doesn't take away from the fact that we have to. Now, it doesn't mean we have to expose ourselves to it every single day. It means that we do have to understand the depths to which is, you know, what this really is and what's going on because we're going to realize as we, we chronicle her story and her ultimate healing through the entire thing, um, we're gonna chronicle what this looks like at an elite level, what happens, and what really, who are the types of people that we're giving our power to when we begin to actually go out and vote and, and get become part of this system as it is today, right? We're not talking about voting in the future, we're talking about as it is today, right? This is what, these are the types of people that we're sort of keeping in power in, in a lot of different ways because this is a widespread issue. So without further ado, let's get into this. Annika Lucas shares an incredible story in these first two parts. Be sure to really, really sit down and dive into these ones because they are gonna get a little bit intense and we're going to uh, have a meditation at the end of the second part, which is gonna be really important in this entire process. So here's Annika, she's gonna tell you her story. Okay, hi, I'm Richard Enos with Collective Evolution, and we're here today with Annika Lucas. And we believe that Annika has a, a very important story to tell and has very important insights to give us, not only in terms of our own personal healing, but in terms of where we go as a collective. So, welcome, Annika. Um, thank you. So, what, uh, what I wanted to start with first is for you to give an explanation of your experiences, your story, your life story. My life and story. Your life story is kind of the foundation for so much learning and so much insight that we can get. So um, I understand that in, uh, in some ways you don't remember quite everything from what happened, especially in your childhood. I remember the important things. You remember the important things, and uh, and maybe you can tell the story and however mm -hmm. you want. That'll help us understand what your experiences are. So then we can go on to to talk about what we can learn from those. Oh, thank you. Yes, I will share my story, my life story. I'll try to um, give an overview. Um, I was born in Belgium in 1963 and my mother was single and she was um, not well and um, abused me from um, birth onward. And she married when I was three and we moved um, from Brussels to um, the Flemish part of the country. She was Flemish, but I actually spoke French at that time. I was uh, three and a half. And um, she, she married someone, and I think right away I was uh, targeted by, the, by a countess whose daughter was in my class. And I think maybe this countess saw that my mother wasn't well, um, and she arranged for a woman to be our cleaning lady and she and her husband um, teamed up. They groomed me for about a year. So this was all over some time um, because I was probably just around my sixth birthday when this couple first took me to an orgy. They, uh, well, he, the grooming 
ended with them sexualizing me and also verbally abusing me and then I was taken to the orgy. So the groom, by the grooming, what, what do you mean exactly? If for people to understand. Um, well, they spent a year uh, taking me to all... I, I learned swimming with them. Um, and they took me and they, they, in groups of kids, so they were talking about... They said it was their, their nieces and nephews, more girls than boys. And, you know, they were always different children and they would just take me out with them. To on, they would do things, you know, go to the park, go swimming, that, that became like a weekly thing. And they always offered my mother to take me off her hands. So, um, and I never liked them, either of them. So I never wanted to go, but my mother wasn't well, so she was just taking it. And um, before, the, it was perhaps the same weekend, perhaps not, but before I was taken to the orgy, the man raped me. And the woman yelled, screamed at me. And um, they took me to an, an orgy where everyone was... Uh, taking drugs and dressed as hippies, but I realized later that they were actually not hippies. They were, they were all aristocrats. It was happening in a castle. And um, had um, degrading experiences in that first night. Um, I felt so humiliated. I was made to take part in some, like the man took me on a stage um, and that was just right, there were a lot of people around but most of them were so high they weren't really paying attention even though he was abusing me on this stage and I was naked and then after he had um, done this kind of show with me where he had done really gross things. He left me there and I was just left on the, lying on this black stage. It was just a low stage like that, but it was in this room which was kind of a salon and all these people were just around and people were actually bar barely paying attention. Um, so I stood up and this was the first time when I knew I had to do something or else I would die in internally. So I stood up and I, I said, you can't do this to me. I'm going to make sure that you'll all be punished. Um, I spoke about my stepfather who was the mayor of a village. My stepfather is going to put you all in jail. And then I was taken over by the uh, man who had welcomed us that day and had basically dealt with the couple who were the, the pimps and I guess he, uh, they brought uh, three girls that day and he was uh, disappointed that there wasn't a boy. But my hair was short so he decided he was going to use me. Um, that had happened before this, this show. And now he came back. This, I called him an old pederast. And I started getting back into these, these uh, circumstances. I started calling him an old, an old pederast who liked boys. He was fat. He brought me along very calmly, like, you know, um, just like nothing happened like he was my friend. And then I don't quite remember how we got to this place, but we went somewhere else. And we went into an, a basement. It was a large basement, a large cellar, vaulted ceilings. So it was maybe under another mansion or castle, I'm not sure. Or maybe it was the same place, I don't really know. 
but we were walking for it seemed like a very long walk and I thought I was going to get killed and I tried to just attune myself to him even though I didn't like him and I felt guilty for not liking him but he was very casual he was um, just saying well we know we like you here and we wouldn't want anything to happen to you and I was um, trying to connect and then we reached um, the end there was it was as if there were several compartments of this cellar so when we reached the last compartment there was a, a cement tub that was built into the floor and uh, there was nothing in the tub but behind the tub so when we reached this um, a, a body came into view of a, a young a very young woman a teen she seemed like a woman to me because I was just probably just six years old so he was just casually saying that you know he didn't want anything to happen to me and they wanted to keep me and it was just that I shouldn't say anything that you know we don't want to talk about anything we don't we want to keep it a secret so he did that very gently right? yeah but the suggestion was very very clear yes that yes if I speak I'll be killed I'll be I'll be killed and this is very real because we're looking at a real body And I try to speak anyway, because I thought, well, they're saying I can't speak to my stepfather because I said I was going to tell him. So I try to tell my mother. And I'm not sure when, and I'm not sure how many times I went back with this couple. But at some point, my mother took over from them and started driving me there herself. She actually got a car. She didn't drive, so she got all excited. She got her driver's license, and because of my stepfather's position as the mayor, she didn't have to do a driving test. So she was proud. She actually took me to get her driver's license, to pick up her driver's license, because she was very proud of it. And then she got a little car, and that was very unusual at the time, that people had two cars, two-car household in Belgium. I got a little car. She got an automatic car, the only one available at that time, because in Belgium cars were not automatic. So she got the only model that had, uh, you know, that was an automatic car, Dutch model, very small. And, and then she started to drive me to these places herself. She would drive me drop me off. She'd never come in. And then the idea was that she would be there at dawn. And if I didn't come out at dawn, she'd just wait. And so she'd get calls from the woman, the countess, who lived in the village, and just take me wherever. Usually it was orgies to castles with uh, aristocrats and then there were also these other people there I started to get a sense of the, the people they were not all aristocrats they were politicians um, I just knew that they were I learned to measure power then like I learned to measure who was you know the ones you have to be careful about the, the ones who had power um, and she also would sometimes take me just one to one house to one man keep me out of school there was always a doctor writing notes so the system of having a child live at home and either their parents I mean this was unusual I think I, I don't think any other children were um, pimped out by their parents. I think the pimps usually infiltrated into the families like these, this couple had done. But um, 
to send the children back home. That was the genius way of having the children available for whenever they needed them. And in a week I would go to school. And um, when I was nine, um, so there was a boss, there was a boss in the network, and he was clearly the most important person. That person I recognized later was a, a minister. He was an, a cabinet minister in Belgium, and he was also prime minister several times. And um, he and his friends were like the, the group that was clearly running everything. And when I was nine years old, I was sent in a car with two handlers with another child and driven to Switzerland. And um, when we arrived there, we were also sent in a tunnel, another tunnel. We were outside for just a second in the uh, very lovely air, and then there was some um, portal outside that was opened, and we walked through it. And it, yeah, I don't think you could see that it was anything from the outside. It was just a gate, and then we walked in a, a very long underground tunnel. And there were torches on the sides of the walls that were burning with flames. So we got to the end, and the handlers met other handlers there. And then a, a man came out, and he was a perpetrator. And he, um, he decided that it was decided there, those children were brought there for this man. He was American. He spoke French, and I understood French. So he, he decided that there were two children. One was for him to rape, and one was to be sacrificed. And he decided that the boy should be sacrificed. And, um, well, I knew that boy. I had spent time with him. and. Um, he was a little bit backwards, he was a little bit slow, so I felt extremely protective of that boy. And um, I had comforted him on the way over in the car. And I tried to hold him. Oh, I tried to... Um, I, picked, I had picked him up and walked with him because he was tired from the walk, and I held him and I tried to hold on to him. And while well, he was torn from me, and um, this perpetrator. Um, this was a very large underground area with a lot of symbols on the floor and fires burning. And there was a large altar and there was a, a, a man who I thought was a baron. I'd known him, he was Belgian. He was the executioner. I found out later I recognized him in picture. I found out later he was a lawyer at the time, and he became a baron later. So I was made to watch. This perpetrator made me watch while he raped me. Uh, I didn't know if he, I could, I, well, I've, I've, I've never felt that powerless. I felt powerless a lot, but I felt completely powerless there because I couldn't, he screamed, 
and I could tell that his screams were exciting the people around, that it made them more angry and more violent. And I felt that I'd betrayed him because I felt that I wanted the screams to stop too at one point. And I felt that I betrayed him. He was uh, seven, seven years old. And I was nine. And I was upset. Oh, so he was butchered. He was butchered slowly. And there was this, um, this obsession with the genitals that was this offering, this offering of his genitals to Satan. I mean, I didn't you think of that word at all. It was just everything was black and everyone was wearing black capes. And I learned later that that was a satanic um, ritual. And um, so this perpetrator, I was very upset. And he looked at me threateningly because I, it, it was, I got from him that he thought that I was upset because he had raped me. And I laughed. It was an, I don't know where that laugh came from, but I laughed at the, I was incredulous that maybe he didn't even think that I could be upset about this child that he saw me <laughs> hanging on to. Did he actually s say to you or suggest? No, he didn't say that, but he looked at me threateningly because he looked like he was getting insecure because I was upset. And if I'm upset because he raped me, then I'm mirroring something that he's doing. Right. And so I got the feeling that he thought that I was upset because he had raped me. And, that, and, I, and therefore I'm a threat. And I laughed because I had been raped many, many times by then. That's not why I was upset. And as I laughed, oh, I thought I'm going to get killed. I thought these thoughts were running through my mind. I'm going to get killed for laughing. But I saw this child emerge from him, insecure. He was uh, suddenly I saw this little boy in this perpetrator who's insecure, who, who feels that he's the slow one who feels that he doesn't get it because he didn't know I was laughing. So that he's inse he was now insecure and um, feeling that he didn't belong with the big kids. I got all this information in this moment from looking at him as I laughed. Um, and then he, I told him, no, I was not upset because I, I was upset about the child. I was not upset about you. And then, as I was tuning in, I started to say, I'm not upset about you. And I, st I just started to say, well, you know, the, the, the men that were there had taken off their hoods. And um, most of them were old men, bald, balding, you know, like a lot of politicians, like the bald streak in the middle. And... He was clearly older, he was in his 50s clearly, but he had all his hair and he looked very clean, extremely clean and neat. And so I started to say, well, you are, you are, you know, I'm, I'm not upset that you raped me. And I started to flatter him saying, look at these other, look at these other men, look at these men, you know. And so I started to share this joke that all oh, these men were disgusting looking and he looked much better. And then, um, strangely, I said, he had this long nose and I thought, in this moment when he was insecure, I thought he's, um, 
very insecure about his nose. He thinks he has an, uh, he's ugly. He feels ugly, like he has an ugly nose. And I said, you have a, a very nice nose. And when I said that, he physically transformed. And his nose actually started to look better. And he started to beam. And I suddenly got this myself. I felt myself transforming too. And for the first time, I felt uh, pretty. And he ended up, so this American then ended up thinking I'm sophisticated because I'd laughed. He took me with him to the United States and became a, an important father figure. And being attuned to him, I had to get in the same mindset that, you know, what had happened there that was not, didn't happen. Well, I thought I was going to get killed when I was being on the jet. I didn't see him when I, when I was on the jet. And I thought I was being, wherever I was going to be taken, I was also going to get killed. And I was um, taken at, I was, it was at JFK, but I was taken by a handler off the, the private jet didn't go through customs. He just drove me to a hotel. He put me in a room, in, in a brown room. So I thought, for sure, I'm waiting here to just be killed. Then the handler came and got me back, put me in a car, in the back of a car where he was waiting. And he greeted me like, you know, he was really happy to see me. So I uh, spent this time with him, and he educated me about several things. He showed me his way of life. He took me to several of his houses, New York City, um, north of New York. I met his staff. He just brought me along everywhere we went. He, an American with a nine-year-old Belgian girl, nobody ever <laughs> seemed to wonder. He was very powerful. I could tell he was very powerful. I realized later that probably I and the boy were sent to Switzerland to get in his good graces by the leader of the network in Belgium, that it was a, a gift, mm. a tr some kind of trade. So I spent three weeks, I think, in the United States with this person, sailing with him on his boat. Um, to Maine, to his property there. So he had properties everywhere. He took me to three of them. And he uh, suddenly started rejecting me on the trip to Maine. And um, we stopped over somewhere, saw a friend of his, one of the leaders of the families, I later realized. And I uh, heard him talking. and. I'm good with languages, so I actually understood what they were saying in English. You know, he thought I spoke French only, but they were, he was talking about me to this other person as if I'm this example that children are very well suited, you know, to have sex with and very sexual beings and um, it's part of what I think is the agenda sexualizing children and just not recognizing the uh, innate innocence of children. So he was uh, demonstrating that through me, that I was so adaptable and that clearly, you know, this I'm, I was the proof mm. that uh, this was a good idea to have sex with children. And he bought me a dress. He taught me what good food. I mean, I ate very good food. He taught me how to eat it. He taught me about art. Um, he invested this time and he kept saying that I belong to his class of people. I belong to his family even. I never met anyone of his family but I was in his, his houses and so I felt finally I belong somewhere and I'm also high. I'm connected to him and I'm on this cloud of privilege which is such a high, incredible. So that alone, you don't need any drugs. You know, you just mm -hmm. feel like you're above 
the world above everything and everyone, and everything was so clean and so beautiful, you know. Um, gosh, even nature seemed more beautiful than the parts that he owned because it was all so clean. Right. And um, he sent me back. He, he started to judge me when I got a, a runny nose on the sailboat. So he started to become distant but polite. And then he sent me off. Big smile, sent me off back on the jet. But he stayed. He was going to see me again. He sent me off to... The, the jet went back to Switzerland. I was picked up by the leader. I was high the whole way through. As I thought I loved, I felt. I found, you know, a father. I'm loved. He's going to see me again. He's going to you know, bring me into his family somehow. That was my thought. I was convinced that was going to happen. I was picked up by the, the, the cabinet minister who was the leader of the network at the airport who was really annoyed at having to be the gopher, clearly. He didn't appreciate having to drive me around. But he took me somewhere right away to a facility close by and immediately some some tests were done, like some things. I was strapped down in a sort of lab-like setting. I was strapped down. And there were two men in white lab coats and he. And so they took things, they, um, they, they, they took things from, from my uterus. And um, had some needles. Definitely. And then I was brainwashed. So then I, w I was sexually stimulated while I was strapped down while the, the Belgian was screaming into my ear that if my man leaves me, I'm, I'm worth nothing and I should just kill myself. And my life's worth nothing, just kill yourself. You're just... So there was this, while the sexual stimulation was happening, And then he drove me, after that, he drove me to Germany, to a place there. And this is something I recently recovered. It explains a lot about things of my life, as any memory always does when it starts to fall into place, when the pieces of the puzzle start to fall into place. It certainly explains a lot, and then there's this this healing, that takes, this integration that takes place, that's very important um, for my well-being. I was there for um, a month. And so I'll briefly say that it was a kind of a training plus eugenics. It was a eugenics cl clinic. What do you mean by eugenics in this, in this particular case? So I was taught... I was shown a lot of videos uh, or film, whatever. My eyes were pried open and I was made to watch. And I was, I was made to watch um, people engaging in all kinds of sex acts, but I was made to watch their faces. And I was taught through, it was systematic, it was very well done in that sense that it was structured really well so that I could start to understand that certain physical features, like, Certain physical features are going to mean that for that man's genitals, for example. Or looking at certain physical features, like that's what that man likes sexually. So I could see from looking at someone's face what they like, and then looking at someone's body, what they like sexually, what they are about sexually, what they need sexually. So that was most of it. That was most of this training. So I watched a lot of was made to watch a lot of film. But I was also starting to understand because, because it was also true. So there's a correlation somehow between the way that the face develops and people's addictions and everything. Um, all the trauma is actually all 
somehow expressed. It's, it's all visible. We just don't usually look at it. We don't usually see it. So I was taught to, to see it. So in this case, you're, you feel like you're being brainwashed, but also you're, you're getting to understand a deeper truth about you know, what things mean when people have certain faces, reactions, yes, traits, physical characteristics. Traits, like with the eyes especially. Yeah. Around the eyes especially, it really shows. Like if someone's addicted to sex, for example, there's certain creases that appear. And they're, they're always the same. And when someone masturbates, for example, you, there's a certain, there's certain type of other type of crease that appears in, under the eyes. So uh, you can see sex addiction very clearly. And then I was made to see all the differentiations of the different kinds of sexual addictions that people have and what, because I was being trained to be a sex slave for the elite. Um, but also things were done. So there were, there were a lot of things done to my head. Um, and there seems to have been some technology used that we're not, that should not have been in 1972, that should not have been used. I think there were lasers used on me. There were lasers put on my body. And there were things performed on my body as well. I don't know. Meaning that the people at that time didn't, realized that technology was available. So was it, it was ahead of its time. It was ahead of its time. Yeah. And there was a doctor there, and I, I recently found him. So not only was I made to see all of these videos, but there was also the main doctor there. I didn't see him that often, but he was the main, the leader there. Very scary looking uh, man who I, I found, his picture, who uh, was an, a Nazi. He was part of the Nazi party. He was not very active, but then he got a very big public role afterwards as a doctor. And he was interested in eugenics and he was funded by this American perpetrator. Okay. I, I didn't know that, of course, but I was also, there were also a lot of programs put in place to sort of make sure that I wouldn't remember the doctor's face, for example. So there were suffocation programs put in place. So when I, when I saw his face first, I started to suffocate. And so I had to break through these, breathe through these very strong suffocation programs that I, and, and then when I finally saw his face, I had a very strange reaction because I don't think I've ever felt that much hatred. Right. So, so much pure hatred that I just wanted to to d somehow this this revenge was very very uh, ripe in when I saw his face on online. And and this is would this be around 2013 we're talking about? No, it? no. This is re more recently. I I had um, started speaking publicly about what had happened to me in 2013, but this is more recent. This is in the in this past year. Right. This really when this perpetrator died. The American perpetrator died, and that I think I wasn't safe, emotionally safe, to remember him until he was dead. Mm. So it was once once he died, I saw that that everything started to come back and make sense, and just slowly, because when a memory comes back, it could mean anything. It doesn't necessarily mean that it's a memory. You know, I'm just starting to get these images, and I'm starting. To, it's really not until they are felt until the the feelings that are connected to this and all the repressed all that are that have been repressed for all that time and that have been maybe coming in at inappropriate times when there's yeah. something triggered yeah. it's only when those feelings are connected to their right. original trauma right. that the integration then happens and then and then know that this actually happens exactly you have that record that's the key to the recognition of that say yeah this is in my past and yes. there's no doubt about it. There's no doubt. I right. felt it. Right. No, I cannot doubt it. Right. Um, and I didn't, of course, when I was in Germany as a nine-year-old girl, I could have never imagined that this perpetrator, who was my father, that was connected to all of this abuse that I was experiencing there. So that year... That summer, it was a summer, it was in July I went with this perpetrator to the United States. In August I spent the time in this 
it was a dirty lab. I mean, it was Germanic in certain ways, but it was very dirty place with like a little black half, you know, um, curtain. And, and, and I was the oldest child there. So it was particularly torturous because most of the, most of the children there were babies and toddlers. that were being trained. And I was strapped down most of the time. I was strapped on a sort of a cot type thing. So I couldn't, um, again, you know, this helplessness, this powerlessness that I couldn't, because um, the, they were crying. And I was just powerless to, to pick them up or to comfort them. And somehow you always, through all this, you always had that care for the innocent, right? Sure. Yes. Yeah. I didn't feel innocent. Right. But I, I felt that the, the other children... The other children, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, I had been loved as a child, as a baby. So my mother was abusive, but I was loved by by a caretaker. So I got my mother's abuse and the numbness and the, and then I had the caretaker who would bring me back to myself, wrap me on her body, who was my real mother for three years. Mm -hmm. So my mother went to work, so I went to this caretaker a lot, very sweet. And so I knew what it was like to just be me. I got this experience of being seen as an innocent baby. And I think because of that, that vibration, you know, it's a vibration. It's this vibration of love, of, of unconditional love that as a baby I was just um, accepted as in that phase of my human life, this completely innocent human being, as that was seen and recognized, mm -hmm. I was then able to have this blueprint inside of what it means. Though I should tell you, I'm not really completely sure about that because I work with people who've been through similar things and I don't know if all of them have had that experience of being loved, but they still have the heart. Uh, that was the question I was going to ask. I was going to say, without which, without this experience, does everything else, does your the whole rest of your life play out very differently, you think? I think so. Yeah. But I have to tell you that I'm faced every day with people who I've been through as much as I've been through. And they have the same caring, the same love. I mean, we weren't able to express that to each other in the network, and I certainly never did again after the little boy who was, who was butchered. Um, I never again allowed myself to hmm. be close to another child. Um, so I didn't really... I suspected that underneath the way that we were pitted against each other, that we really did care for each other. And um, I can speak more about that later, but um, to return to that um, Germany right. lab, I, I was so in, in the, I was also brainwashed. So there was also an attempt to, to use my head somehow and to, uh, I was strapped down, and then, uh, and then there, were, there were things put in my head, big needles put in my head. And there was this um, attempt to, this forceful attempt to make me believe another, that I'm a whore, that I'm, I'm only a whore. And so there was this voice rising in that terror because it was very terrifying. I was on my back and a strap down and then there's these things in my head and there's things being put in my head mm. and my brain 
going through my brain. So from that, there, um, I was repeating my truth. I am, I am me. I am me. <laughs> when my my affirmation was. But you I am know me. what that. I know what, what that, that means. means. Yeah. Which is. Yeah. yeah. I didn't feel innocent, but I perhaps felt that I had access. There was some access. There was a portal there back to it. Yeah. That I, that's me. That is me. And then I, that uh, everything else that was imposed is not me. So I am me. And so they're doing experiments and they're doing experiments and they're thinking and hoping, well, maybe this will work, maybe this will work. And they weren't thinking and hoping. They, they knew what they were doing and usually it did work. Okay. Yeah. No, it's more that I was one of the difficult ones always. Okay. Understood. Uh, and I was also too old. Okay, yes, like you were saying, they had some very, very young children and babies there and they were already starting that program. Right? Yeah. The, you know, the, the, the deliberate dissociating through trauma right. so that you can go into an altar and then become the whore or whatever altar, you know, because there's, uh, as the whores, there's very many different altars. There's one for each, you know, perpetrator, basically. Right. And that was a month, so a month there. And that doctor, yeah, I just, there was this, this great anger and like, ha, 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 I got, I see your face. I know it's you. I know it's you. Mm. There, I had that feeling. <laughs> Part of the healing, you know, yeah. the revenge and the anger. Yeah. Yeah, to overcome, you, and you saw the intentional programming to have him wiped from your face, and then you see him and you recognize him, and that in itself. After is after all the suffocation. <laughs> yes, exactly. Okay. Yeah, <sighs> having to get get through that painful process and the deprogramming. Yes. Right. Yes. And in the next year, so then I was taken back home. My family had gone on a vacation without me. No questions asked. I mean, there's, um, they went to Austria. Um, and my mother, my mother said, you know, we didn't have a good trip. I think that's maybe the closest that she could ever come to any kind of like. Right. <laughs> it's nothing, but. <laughs> it's, well. She was trying to say something. Did you ever get a sense that your mother had a trauma in her childhood or, you know? Oh, for sure, trauma? yeah. Yeah. She was extremely traumatized. Right. She right. was uh, born in uh, 39, so uh, in a town close to the German border. So a town that was bombed where there was famine. Her father was in the concentration camp in Bergen belsen And... So as a prisoner of war, not as a as a concentration camp prisoner. But her mother died when she was right five, six years old, just right around that same time that she that she started to put me in these life threatening situations. Mm -hmm. Clearly she had been sexually abused. She acts like that. She doesn't remember it. But she acts like an over-sexualized five-year-old little girl. That's how she acts. I know that her father, he survived the camp. He wasn't cool. He never touched me sexually, but he once slapped me on the behind. Very inappropriate. I don't know. Clearly she had been sexually abused. I don't know by whom. But never any healing so there was she was like this 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 five-year-old over sexualized child who firmly believed that men and sex men who would sexualize her or men who were rapists were her her that she had to placate them mm. and then 
all the self-hatred was, was projected onto me. But no sense of anything, no boundaries, no, no awareness at all. And did you feel that her family was always part of this network in some way, or there was no no they weren't there? No. no, that's why she didn't go in. She didn't go in. She kind of felt envy. She acted when she dropped me. She acted as if I was gonna got to go to the cool party, mm. and she, the victim, didn't get to go. So she was so. Putting me there in her stead, she really wanted to be that celebra sexualized, celebrated for her sexuality child. You know, mm. She wanted to be that. And she had this idea that I was going to get a husband. I mean, I was six years old, but she had some idea that there was going to be a marriage coming from that. I was going to marry into... Aristocracy. <laughs> yeah. Ah. Oh. Okay, so let's continue. Mm -hmm. um, having now remembered, so you had that period of a month in Germany. Yes, and afterwards I was taken to Germany several times. So I was going to school, but I was taken out of school a lot to go back to Germany to be deployed as a sex slave for a German, um, powerful German people. So I recognized some people, definitely top, top of the power line right. that uh, sexually abused me. I learned German. I learned to speak German. I spent enough time there to um, learn the language. And then, and I, I'm not sure, maybe it was about a year later, I saw that American perpetrator back again. And I didn't want to believe that he was connected to this. So, but he started to question me. He, he was very happy to see me. Was first, you know, at first it was like very happy. We're all, and I'm thinking I'm now going to go to America with him, and I'm going to be his daughter and his family is adopting me. That's what I was thinking. Right. And this this meeting was sort of planned on his part, right? Mm -hmm. He's, it was his time to come back and see you and mm -hmm. did the next step of... Yes. Yeah. And it was in a, an extremely formal uh, building, a mansion, but it seemed like it was a government building or something, but very beautiful again. But we, we didn't meet in a room that had a bed in it. We met in, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in another room. I don't know. I don't remember, but there was no bed in it. That's what I remember. Different. Yeah. Different from other... Different vibe. From, from other meetings. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, so first he was very happy and I was very happy. And then I guess I had a, an inkling that there was some connection because we were in Germany. And I just wanted to confirm that he wasn't involved. And then he was not so happy. And I told him that, you know, I'd had a very hard time. And, um, you know, he said it was to make me strong. Um, and it was the only way, it was the only way that he would be able to see me. Is to see me as a, a sex slave. So, and he had asked me questions about the men that I'd seen. So before we got into the, 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 the grit of everything, he'd uh, ask me questions about these men. And he, he told me, what is, what's their weakness? Right. So that was part of the programming also to, to spot a man's weakness, just right on. And I, I told him what their weakness was. Like the, the, the one who had seen the most often there were two, but the one that I'd seen the most often, he thought he was a good man. So that was his weakness. And he laughed when I said that. The American laughed because, of course, in his mind, no one's good. And I was thinking, well, he's not good because 
he's a pedophile, obviously. But that was not on his. That was not really on his mind. Right. But then, when um, I was aware that he was involved, I got angry and terrorized. I felt a terror again. And then he um, he came. I guess what was the end of his cycle, where I had seen his vulnerability that he felt that he didn't belong when I left and he didn't know why I was laughing and he yeah. was the kid who was always behind yeah. and couldn't really quite follow with the other kids right. so now he could say that I did not belong because I was vulgar I was he said I'm I'm vulgar and that I he, he should have never given me as much attention as he did because I always just be the lowest of the low and that's who I am that's why I'm the lowest of the low that's why because I'm vulgar. Right. So in the the first situation, you were able to connect with him when you were in the the, the dungeon, the basement, and, and get him feeling good about himself. And this time, your reaction to his involvement in that program, you did make an attempt exactly. to reconnect and flatter and yes. get in his good graces and so forth. Exactly. I didn't and, and I didn't that, do that was I kind didn't of play your evolution right. of your I don't know. I didn't feel that way. <laughs> right. In retrospect, for sure. But what I felt was that the, the terror that I'd experienced and the, the attempt to keep my soul alive was... And it was nothing, none of that was conscious. Right. So I felt that I messed up in a really big way. And I just took it all on. I just felt that I... It was all my fault, and it's true. You know, I could look very sophisticated, but at the bottom of it all, this belief settled in me that I'm really not worthy. I'm really just the lowest of the low. And that's a belief that I held until I recently unlocked all of this, that I, I never made money in my life. Now, I have privilege. You know, we're not talking about, I have privilege, but I never was able to be empowered enough financially. So I realized that he needed me to feel that way. That's the connection with the abuse. He needed me to feel that way so that he could feel that he deserved all the billions that came with his family fortune and the billions that he made in his life because I was feeling that I didn't deserve it. And there was this polarity in through the abuse that he constantly, this projection, I'm sure, lasted for the rest of his life. And I got to carry it for the, for, for the rest of his life. So it was at my expense. And in, and in the larger sense of this, it's, that's, that's it. You know, the, 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 the upper classes are in the position where they are. Um, by, oh, thanks to everybody uh, carrying the burden for them. And of course, the more disadvantaged the person is, the more pain they have to carry. They're made to carry. Yeah. And it's not one without the other. That's what maybe isn't so well understood. Right, and that's when we're going to be talking about healing. That's when we're going to come to understand like how important it is for each person to step up individually if they look at the world instead of making a bad guy and saying we've got to kill them right it's you know <laughs> i've got to uh look inside myself rise up become have the self-esteem yes and uh and that and then the other side of the polarity just sort of wisps Fizzles away fizzles out exactly right? Yeah. Yes. Yes, if each person becomes empowered from within, there will be no need for an outer authority that lays down the rules and then basically abuse their power because that's all that's ever going to happen. Right. That's the only reason people are in a place of authority. And anyone who starts out with good intentions, we just had an election here. Mm. Anybody, I see them, you know, oh, and everyone's so excited about this one. 
by the time that they actually are in a place where they supposedly could make a difference, they're completely sold out. Yeah. And otherwise, they fail. They leave the system or they get killed. There's no way that anybody can rise through the political power paradigm right. and end up at the top with a good heart. Right. And, and with truly, truly able to do anything there. Anyway, those are the people that I met that, that yeah. b abused me. Yeah. And now I'm working with other people who have experienced the same things I have. So I know that it's continued and I know that the current leaders are the same as the ones that I ran into in the 60s and the 70s. Exactly. It's exactly That's the same the thing situation. is happening. Yeah. And, and they're, they're, I think a pedophile is better able to be controlled. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, that's part of the system from the, the higher up in the hierarchy brings in people who can be controlled, then they become controllers themselves. And everybody's trying to prove themselves. Yeah. Every time they act, yeah. they constantly have this need to say, I deserve to be where I am. I am who I am. They have the and need. The they have need. the need because they don't have the self-esteem. Right. They don't so they need to say, I, right, exactly. They have to yeah. prove it to themselves all the time. And prove it to themselves really means that I'm better. So you have a system that where you climb. And then you have the people with the good heart and they have no desire to climb this hierarchy to get to the top. They just want to be good with everybody that, they're, that, that they encounter, which is why it's kind of difficult to find someone who has the power and the heart and the desire to, and, and, and has the will to get to a certain position where they have power and maintain that. No way to keep your integrity. Yeah. But people with a good heart, most people are good. Right. Most people are good. But, but the brainwashing, the brainwashing is really intense. And I, everybody's brainwashed. I got myself out of my brainwashing through the healing. Right. But the brainwashing is intense and it's everywhere. And that's the... That's the waking up that needs to happen. That's exactly. Okay, so I'm not going to get into too much at the end of this one. What I am going to say is that, again, if this was a little intense to hear some of the things that you heard, that's okay. It's normal. There, you know, there's a lot of different emotion. There's a lot of different feeling here. And Annika has been incredibly courageous to come forth and share this information. Um, and especially as we get into part two, where we're going to get into a little bit of a deeper aspects of the story, um, it's, it's going to be important not only for, you know, obviously her journey to go through uh, what she has gone through, but but it's, it's going to be important for us to pay attention to the emotions, the different feelings that are going to come up as we go through this. So not much else to say here at the end of part one, but when we get into part two, we're going to have a little bit more um, at the end that we're going to discuss.